Banks came about because large amounts of gold were too cumbersome to carry around. In those days, men carried purses because they had gold coins. But you can imagine that large transactions involving bars of gold can be very strenuous, which is why banking became useful. So you would place gold on deposit, and the bank would issue you a deposit receipt, a certificate of guarantee, or a banknote, later became known as money. Business merchants would exchange a banknote, which was the proof of how much gold they had on deposit for goods and services. Then the merchant would go to the bank and present the banknote to take possession of the gold or just exchange it again with another merchant. Each town had its bank and printed its own notes in those days. The number of notes issued was determined by how much gold reserves each bank had in its vaults. The bankers realized that only they knew how much gold they had on deposit. So, they took advantage of that opportunity by printing more notes than they had gold. Since the banknote was as good as gold, people readily exchanged it, and the bankers became wealthy from this scheme. This was the beginning of the pyramid scheme that continues to this day. They knew that it was unlikely that every depositor would come to withdraw their gold simultaneously, so they just recycled the deposits and withdrawals. All gold looked the same anyways and was measured by weight. Eventually, larger banks took over the local banks until only one central bank supplied money to all the local banks based on gold, its gold reserves. Then came the fractional lending system, which made it legal for banks to lend out more money than the value in their vaults. Thus, if the reserve requirement is 10%, a bank that receives a $100 deposit may lend out $1,000. During the Great Depression in the United States from 1929 to 1932, what the bankers thought would never happen did finally happen. A wave of bank runs happened when depositors in large numbers panicked and withdrew their funds at once, causing then-President Franklin D. Roosevelt on March 12, 1933, to close all banks. Then, in 1933, he proceeded to outlaw private gold ownership except for jewelry. Gold was taken out of the picture entirely, with the exception that the value of paper money was still stabilized by the fixed price of an ounce of gold. Then, on August 15, 1971, President Richard Nixon ended the set price of an ounce of gold, allowing money's value to become unstable. With the gold standard erased, banks went to a fiat currency. The words printed on the dollar bill changed from this bill is redeemable in gold to this bill is legal tender for all debts, public and private. So what exactly is a fiat currency? A fiat currency holds value by mutual agreement. For example, all the citizens of a country agree to accept a means of exchange by mutually agreeing to do so. It's also accepted by order of the government, meaning that the money has value because the government has ordered it to be so. This order is backed by the full military might of the government and its willingness to force anyone to accept the currency. Should one country not agree to accept the currency of another, it could cause a war. Money has been and remains the only reason for war. The value of a fiat currency is ruled by world supply and demand and is inflated or deflated by interest rates reasonably easily. This is why gas used to be 50 cents per gallon, but it's now $4 per gallon. It is not that gas went up, 
It is the value of the money used to purchase gas that went down. Once a currency becomes a fiat, its value doesn't exist. Instead, a holding value in tangible resources, it has become common for people to keep it in the means of exchange, especially a fiat medium of exchange that does not have any real value like real estate means real and tangible property. All economies of empires eventually reach the point of having a fiat currency. They all go through the same stages. All empires start with money of real value, which is precious because of its limited quantities. To allow the rich to enjoy their money without interruption by the revolt of the poor, the empire implemented social programs to meet the survival needs of its poor for food and shelter. In the United States, this is done with programs such as food stamps and Section 8 housing projects. The empire's wealth is poured into expanding its military. The expanded military is put to use in unnecessary wars. The wars drive up the expenses of the empire. As a result, the money is replaced with a type of money that can be produced in unlimited quantity and is of no real value, such as paper money, fiat money. The value of the new money continues to decrease inflation, which is seen by the people as if the cost of tangible goods such as food is increasing. The wealthy begin to move their wealth out of the valueless money and back into the land, real estate, precious commodities such as gold, cotton, and silver. The price of precious commodities increases drastically because of the new demand and the fact that the fiat money has no real value and eventually dies. Those who have not moved their wealth back into items of real value will be left bankrupt.